Sometimes there have seemed to be three different versions of Jonathan Meads on TV. He's made programmes with equal authority on architecture, food and travel. But now, in another sense, we only see half of him. He lost seven stone in weight after retiring as restaurant critic of the Times. In his opinions, though, <coughs> he never gives half measure. In Who's Who, the description at the beginning, which some people have, which you have, is journalist, writer and television performer. Is that the order of priorities? Um, it probably was when I filled in that thing in Who's Who. I, I, um, I, I don't do nearly as much journalism now. Um, I do much more telly. I mean, over the past um, five years, I, I've been doing very constant telly, whereas it used to be slightly peripheral. And television performer is an interesting phrase. Some people would say presenter um, or journalist, but it suggests, I mean, you're rather trained, which we'll talk about again later, but it suggests more a showmanship side to it. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, you know, there's, um, it's as much music hall as it is lecture hall stuff I do, I think. And, um, you know, I might want to be Geoffrey Hill, but part of me also wants to be Benny Hill. Um, so, and it's not a question of pushing the Geoffrey out or pushing the Benny out. It's a, finding a way of combining them. A lot of the tapes I watched to prepare for this, they still had the continuity announcement on the beginning from transmission. And I was struck by how often they would say, now prepare for strong opinions, or Jonathan Mead tells it like it is. Have you deliberately set out to be provocative, to stir things up? Uh, no, I don't set out to be provocative. I, I set out to, on the other hand, to tell it how it is, or how I think it is, which may not be how it is at all. Um, no doubt someone else would say that it, I don't tell it how it is, but um, it's not a, a question of deliberate provocation, no. Although there is a sort of mission, it struck me. Um, outside the main body of the TV work, there's a Heart of the Matter special, which begins with a film from you complaining about the level of censorship in the British media and the kind of nannying of language. I mean, that is, you do believe that we're too soft in a lot of the media. Um, yeah, I think this is a fairly recent thing. Um, a generation like that of, say, uh, John Osborne, King's the Amos, um, would, I think, um, where it's still alive, be absolutely appalled by what's going on now. You can't call anything by its real name. Um, there is a, we've developed a national talent for euphemism. Uh, a, a, along with various other undesirable national talents like self-delusion. You know, we're the best at everything. We're the best at cooking. We're the best at football. We're the best at tennis. We're not. But that talent for euphemism, that comes from what is loosely and lazily now called PC, but it's an attempt to protect minorities, or at least that's how it began, to protect people from offence. Yes, but, I mean, there is now a tyranny of minorities. Um, there's a tyranny of special pleading, uh, and there's a tyranny of special pleaders, like Gareth Pearce, um, Cherie Blair, Michael Mansfield, etc. In general, have you suffered censorship? Um, yes, I've suffered quite a lot of censorship. In the aftermath of September the 11th, 2001, um, I was forced to cut... Um, quite a protracted scene from surreal film in which we had some um, terrorists wearing their traditional hoods um, doing a song and dance act to YMCA, um, inviting people to come and join the OINLA so that they could um, have fun with guns and be like Bobby Sands and so on. Um, had that run, um, I would have been thought to incite young Irish people to join um, the INLA, even though the INLA was by then defunct. Um, they, really, they really suggested that you might revive Irish terrorism by running this sketch. Single-handedly, yes, yeah. Your intention was not to 
revive Irish terrorism, but you knew you intended to offend people, to stir them up. I, th- I, thought, I thought it would be amusing. Um, and I had this tune going round in my head and wanted to find some other words for it. I mean, you know, the YMCA is a very catchy thing. Obviously too catchy. Um, yeah, I don't know, offend, provoke. Um, there are all sorts of things in, throughout the history of journalism, writing, film, which might look as if they're there to, to offend, but maybe they're there because people are testing how far they can go. I mean, the, the Last Supper in Viridiana, something like that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure what, why, why I do these things. When it happens, are you summoned before men and women at big desks, or is it all done on the um, phone? I, I, have been, I have been summoned on a couple of occasions. Um, more usually, one just hears from... Um, through sort of Chinese whispers. Um, I mean, odd things. I mean, when I made a, a very short program about the BBC's own buildings um, and said there was something disgraceful about um, you know, the, the, the media village and the media village idiots. Um, and why had they spent all this money building that monstrosity at White City when they had cancelled um, much better work by Foster? Um, Alan Yentop got it in the neck at programme review for this, for having had the temerity to allow me to Say, say these things, which seem a fairly obvious point. And traditionally in the BBC, people who have been censured or censored, they are more careful next time because they fear the consequences. Has it ever had any effect on you? No. <laughs> Absolutely none. <laughs> but it must have some effect on your producers. Are you seen as a, as a dangerous figure? No, I, I, I don't, don't think so. I think they see me as a kind of... Um, uh, cuddly little kitten um, of particular dimensions. I mean, rather large kitten, but um, I'm on very amiable terms with, with the people who I work with. Um, and it's a very small group of people, admittedly, over the years, but um, I, I, I've retained pretty good relationships with, with nearly all of them. I've been sued once in my journalistic career of 30-something years, 36 years. And that was for a thing which no one would have... Want, you know, the article in question had been legal and so on. No one noticed this peculiar thing and uh, it cost Condé Nast £20,000 or something. And there's a tradition... You weren't formally banned by this editorially, the BBC thing of balance that they have in news programmes, but it does creep into a lot of BBC programmes of every kind that they say, on the other hand, this, or he is someone who disagrees. Um, you are very opinionated throughout them. For example, in Jerry Building, you say, typically of the Germans, they've done this. Germans are always doing that. Was there any, any trouble over those um, kind of generalisations? Um, no, because I think it's um, so obvious to the audience and to most um, BBC grandees that they've just got some nutter on the loose and, um, you know, they'll send him back to the home later. Have you ever regretted anything you've said or written? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think... Um, I think Je ne regrette rien is one of the most stupid songs of all time. I, mean, I think anyone who's remotely sentient regrets an awful lot of things. Um, I have, but some very, very long ago, I remember one of the first things I wrote was a, well, probably within the first year of sort of professional writing, second year, I wrote a very um, bad mean-spirited review of Transparent Things by Nabokov, which I now think is probably his best book. And I was absolutely blind to it at the time. Not that he'd have cared less. I mean, he just sold sold 50 million copies of Lolita and had fantastic amour prop. But I regret having written that. And I'm sure there are other things, but I can't really remember what they are. 
You grew up in Salisbury, Wiltshire, or you were born there anyway. Um, that has, it has a reputation for being a very polite, sedate place. And also in the 1950s, which has a reputation for being a sedate decade. Is that how you remember it? Um, uh, there are many things I remember about Salisbury. Um, it was quite sedate. Um, it is very, the church in Salisbury has, uh, or had in those days, um, an enormous uh, sort of temporal power. Um, it ruled everything. Um, and what wasn't ruled by the church was ruled by the army. Um, and I can't say that I've ever taken to either of them particularly, and it may be bec because of that. I mean, the, the church was extraordinarily snobbish and um, cold and graceless. Um, and I think my lack of religion came from that. And I, I didn't like the um, philistism of the army or the terrible army camps. And were your parents part of those establishments? No, absolutely not. I mean, they, they sort of struggled between um, lower middle class and middle class. They sort of teetered between. I mean, sort of very, very much on the cusp. And in all that, because um, your writing has always been very architecturally aware, I went to Salisbury recently for the opening of the Edward Heath Museum because he lived in the cathedral. <laughs> he, he lived in the cathedral I know, close. I know. But from what age were you aware of buildings? A very, very tender age. I went to school in the close from the age of four. Um, and I think one was aware that one was in a very special place. Not. I mean, the cathedral is, is fine, but the anthology of buildings around it is, is absolutely remarkable. Um, there's one of each, and it's like one of those pull-out things in, in, a, in, a, in a book, um, showing an example of, you know, th this, this is flamboyant, this is Jacobean, um, this is prehistoric, this is arts and crafts, and so on. And Salisbury Cathedral Close has got one of each, and they're all absolutely spot on. And um, one was told this, but with one's own eyes, you, you, you see it. One, you, you come to um, appreciate it and its richness. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a fabulous place. And again, apart from the architectural awareness, you've always been very socially aware of clothes and food. Again, was that there in childhood? Yeah. Yeah. Both. I mean, in childhood, uh, f food was atypical. My, my mother was um, preposterously francophile. I mean, anything French was better than its British analogue. Um, and that included food. And very peculiarly for petty bourgeois family, uh, we'd go to France a lot because my, my maternal grandfather worked for Southern Railways which also owned the ferries to San Marlo. And we had very, virtually free fares, and probably the only petty bourgeois family in Britain which would go to France for the weekend, and would go there for holidays and stay in very ordinary, the hotels of Les Petits Gens, uh, uh, um, ordinary places and very ordinary restaurants, but a, a food of a quality which was unimaginable in Britain. And equally, um, clothes was a particular obsession from a very young age. And that interest in clothes, where did that come from? I think it was a reaction to um, the, the stuff that my parents dressed me in, <laughs> smocks and with puff sleeves. and. Um, I wanted um, to look like one of the people in a, um, the advertisements in the back of the National Geographic um, where the world was modern somewhere else, where they had square watches made by a company called Hamilton and fountain pens had hooded nibs, um, like Parker 51, which was a very rare thing. And American kids wore these kind of sharp clothes, which um, 
thought was really exciting, probably at the age of six, and then the, about the age of 10, um, the revelation, Tommy Steele singing, singing the blues, wearing drainpipe trousers with sequins down the outside, and I thought this was just great. My parents, of course, were absolutely horrified. <laughs> You talked about your family being on the brink between lower middle class and middle class. You, perhaps to some television viewers, would compute as higher than that because of your voice, your delivery, your confidence. But that, that's from your education. Um, yeah, I had an odd education in, in that I had a, a gay great uncle who um, made a lot of money before the war. He was probably 25 years older than my mother. And he paid a lot of my school fees. I was sent to a kind of muscular Christian public school in the west of England. This is King's College Taunton. It's King's College Taunton, indeed. Where uh, the teaching was dreadful, and if anyone got into Oxbridge, there was a half-day holiday because it was so rare. But what it did teach me was um, skiving and uh, landscape, variety of landscapes. I used to cycle fanatically around these places, um, buying scrumpy and so on. And it was a, a kind of self-education. But I didn't learn anything at the school. But the fact that you wanted to go to Rada and become an actor, that must be something you got from the school. No, it wasn't anything to do with school at all. It was actually uh, immediately post-school when I spent a lot of time in France and became interested um, I became interested in cinema and um, so I'm not particularly in theatre. I, I never go to theatre if I can help it. Going back to the question of what I sound like, I, mean, I arrived at RADA and um, one of the voice coaches got all of us, uh, there are about 25 of us, he got us all to read a piece of prose and then he told us where we came from. And I was absolutely mortified when he said, you come from somewhere within 20 or 30 miles of Southampton. So I determined to get, ri get rid of that accent. I mean, it's, it's no use if you wanted to be an actor, which is, I, which is what I wanted when I went to RADA. There are stars in every generation of RADA. Who were the big names in your generation? Um, David Bradley, um, Stephanie Beecham, um, uh, Michael Kitchen, um, Lisa Harrow, um, Robert Lindsay, um, pretty good people. These are pretty and, big names. And what, <laughs> when you, you know, when you when you're there with these people, you, you sort of realize you think, well, uh, no, you're not going to make it. I mean, um, uh, and also you've got to have the will to 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 do it. And I mean, I'm perfectly uh, aware that I could do a turn, that I could perform, but acting is is you know, to the level that those people, or someone like Tom Chadburn does it. I mean, it's a com completely, completely different thing. And um, when I left, Hugh, Hugh Crutwell, who was the principal, um, said to me, well, you, you know, you might as well forget it till you're middle-aged, um, but you'll, you'll be a very interesting kind of character actor. And 20, 20 years later, I met Hugh, at a, 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 a dinner, and he, he said, um, you know, I always knew you, Dora, as a character actor. The one thing, one thing is I never realised that the character would be called Jonathan Meeks. <laughs> <laughs> complete one-trick pony. Um, but that's a shrewd remark, though, isn't it? Because the, the, act, the RADA, the acting, has helped you as a television performer. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it if I hadn't had that training. I mean, and it was, it really was a training. I mean, it was, um, I wrote that it, it was like a Sandhurst for chorus boys. I mean, it was incredibly disciplined and very, very technical. It was nothing to do with self-expression. It was all to do with knowing how to, to, to use yourself in such a way as to be able to play a part and do what a director told you. What was your best your best role or your biggest role there? Um, I never got any decent roles. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, I, I got odd character parts. And were you big, did you sense early on that it wasn't going to work out as an actor? Um, yeah. Yeah, very early on. But I still enjoyed it, in a way. And at some point in this stage, 
before the TV begins, which we'll come on to, you shift from being someone who's going to be an actor to becoming a writer. But how, how did that happen? Um, I simply I started writing. I, mean, I, 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 I enjoyed it, and it's something you could do by yourself. And if I was going to be resting for the next 20 years, I needed some, something to do. Um, but I, I wrote for a curious magazine called Books and Bookmen. I'm, um, I, I wrote for Time Out. I wrote for Curious. Um, uh, then I worked for, worked for the Observer, um, so on. All, all in fairly menial sort of sort of menial sort of journalism. When you came to publish fiction, Filthy English, nineteen eighty four, the the title is very you, isn't it? Because it suggests that offence might be given to some people, but also that there's going to be some social analysis, which are two of the things you do. Uh, the t title was originally going to be called, was originally Bad Language, and I told Dusty Hughes this, and he promptly nicked it, the bastard. Um, the playwright, so he took it for a play, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. But since one of the, uh, the, the protagonist of one of the stories accuses his um, child, who he's just buggered, of speaking filth, filthy English, um, I changed it to that. And Ian McEwan had published his books of short stories a few years earlier, which had been quite extreme, necrophilia and incest and so on. But you, um, you went beyond that. They, they were extreme stories. They, they were quite extreme. I hadn't, I hadn't read McEwan at this time. It's not, it's not really where, it, where those stories came from. I mean, um, the, the, the most shocking story, or what I'm told is the most shocking story, uh, called The Sylvan Life, came from my mother, um, uh, her recollections of teaching in the New Forest during the Second World War, uh, where there were clearly incestuous families, and um, the best that the, the children of the girl children of these families could hope was that they go on the game in Southampton. I mean, it was, it was desperate lives. Um, and uh, when my mother read this story, she said, she, her only comment was, um, you left out the stuff about the family who said that their children had caught syphilis from a towel. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she was very, very in tune with what her, you know, her son's mentation. So very broad-minded, it seems. Uh, yeah, uh, broad-minded and, and sort of... Um, what you call uh, sort of Augustinian. I mean, it kind of uh, had no religion, but um, believed like I do in some sort of um, secular version of original sin, if you like. That's interesting. So how does that work? Well, the, 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 there is likely to be a capacity for ill and evil in people as there is for good. Um, I can't think why, if one is a humanist or atheist, one is expected to sign up for some kind of utopianism. No, but the argument, as you know, is that um, religious faiths account for it by it coming from somewhere, being given by someone, by God, yeah. these sense of conscience and so on. So for a humanist, a secularist, where do they come from? They're, sim they're innate, they're somewhere, they're in the DNA. Yeah, quite likely. Or, well, in the DNA and also in economic and social circumstance, I suspect. That most, there are obvious and terrible exceptions in the papers every day, that most humans most of the time behave well. Yes, they do. But um, uh, this, and I try and behave well, but my characters don't. After the short stories, there are two... One, the first one in particular, Pompey, very substantial novel. Again, quite extreme, but it's a big book. W was that, again, was that an attempt to establish yourself as a novelist? No, it was just writing a novel. I mean, it was, it was, it was a, um, an attempt to write um, a, a kind of parodic and very complicated family saga. Um, over a um, quarter of a century. The Fowler family business had followed Pompey. They'd 
been at roughly 10-year intervals. So these, these are long projects, these novels. Yeah, I, I write very slowly, and I don't have the time in which to, to, um, to, to, to write great long tracks. I mean, I'm, I'm working on two books at the moment, and proceeding like a kind of paraplegic snail. And your television career also started in the 80s with um, The Victorian House, 1987. Um, I'm interested in your relationship with the medium, because I sometimes think of that thing that the journalist Malcolm Muggeridge said, that TV was for appearing on rather than watching. Um, and there are people like that in TV, but are you one of those people, or do you like TV as a medium? I like TV as a medium, but I'm not sure if I like the way that TV as a medium has been used by the people who control TV. I mean, there's been remarkable stuff on TV in its half-century history, but not enough remarkable stuff. I mean, the, 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 there is a, um, the, the, there's a lot of dross. Um, but I have not... I, no, it's a medium I, I enjoy when it's good. Uh, and the idea that it's just for appearing on, I don't really go along with that. And it would be hypocritical to do so, because I, I do sit down and watch certain things very, you know, very deliberately. So where it really takes off for you is, is, is abroad in Britain. Um, and the image, that's when we start to have a sense of the image. Can we talk about how some of that came about? I was looking at a lot of those tapes and, and wearing dark glasses indoors, which is quite a rare thing to do, and wearing them quite frequently. How conscious was the construction of an image? Oh, totally conscious. Um, but on the other hand, I did tend to wear dark suits a lot of the time and wear dark glasses, so it was just an extension of w what I, I would wear normally, um, but exaggerated, of course. Um, but yes, entirely self-conscious. Because you had a sense that this, to do the kind of thing you wanted to do, you needed to stand out from the average presenter, the people on the news, the people on the sports. Yeah, that, to stand out from them and also to, to stand out from the environments I was in. I mean, if, if you don't expect to see people in the middle of the countryside wearing dark suits and dressed very formally as if they're kind of going off to do a hit or something. Um, and, so, and someone did indeed describe that first series is down your way with the mafia. Um, that's Stephen Pyle. <laughs> that's very good. But one of the reasons people would make those gangster comparisons, I think, the lecture, making you a lecture you can't refuse and so on, was that you were quite an aggressive presence on television. A lot of television presenters are quite polite, and you weren't. There was a lot of attitude there. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of attitude. There was a lot of shouting. Some of that was entirely pragmatic because we did lots of uh, unusual setups and if the camera is on top of a building a hundred meters away um, and you're speaking to it conversationally um, that doesn't work I mean even though um, the mic is picking up everything uh, so you need to shout and uh, again this is something which might originally have had some purpose, like turn up on trousers or something, um, but it becomes uh, part of uh, the whole shtick, um, for better or worse, probably for worse. I mean, I, I, I don't do much bellowing now because I, I don't have the lungs since I gave up smoking. And you say the visual grammar of it, because that is one of the very striking things and always has been where the camera is, the classic, which they call a stand-up if you're not moving, or a walking shot if you are for a presenter, your series did rethink all that, and as is the popular word now, subverted, that sometimes you'd have your back to the camera, you'd be walking away, they'd be split into several different shots, you'd suddenly pop up, up, up at a window in the middle of a speech you'd started within a room. How did that evolve in those series? Um, well, with... Me, the two directors who worked on those three abroad series in the, in the um, 90s, Russell England and David Turnbull, um, we, we would work out ways of doing something that was different. Um, 
sometimes uh, it was different in a way which was okay. Sometimes it didn't work. Um, I suppose I'm to take most of the blame for for, for the worst, and they 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 um, that they should take the laurels for when it did work. What's an example of it not working for you? Um, doing pulling the same stroke too many times. Sure, you can get away with this a couple of times, but when it becomes. Uh, repeated, it becomes just as much a cliché as any other presentational tick. Um, and I, I think that uh, in those things, we, we, we got very pleased with ourselves and um, started, every, every shot had to have some, um, what's it called, Jack coming out of the box or Rabbit coming out of the hat. I mean, it, it, and, or card, you know, it, it, it all became, um, uh, over elaborate. A, a very commonplace criticism was that you have to watch these things twice to find out what's going on because there is so much going on. On the other hand, um, th there's always so much going on in everything I write, which is for reading. Um, I prefer, I'm a, I'm a kind of maximalist. Um, more is more, more is good. Um, there's a common view that TV during the 90s became less serious and risk-taking. You were a, a posh-sounding, highly educated man saying and writing complex things. Did you feel any of that pressure, that it was getting harder to do the things you wanted to do? Yes, from, the, from 97, very definitely. It isn't so hard now, but there, there, was, a, there was a period when... Um, uh, yeah, th th things things were tricky. I mean, I, it didn't it didn't particularly worry me because I thought, well, I can always do something else. Um, I thought it was a pity, but um, in general, that things became much more formulaic. But I, I see it moving away from that. I think there's a very deliberate reaction against. Obviously, they're, they're always at any point in the history of television going to be formulas, but it, it, there's a the amount of room for stuff which is not formulaic seems, again, to be slightly increasing, I think. If nothing else, my stuff has proved that an awful lot of people, not just people who, you know, who, who are media studies students or something, or art students, that a wide range of people uh, can appreciate telly which doesn't speak down to them. Um, and they enjoy it. By the time you appeared in Mead's Eats, um, 2002, your appearance belied the title. Um, you'd lost a vast amount of weight, not half the man you used to be, as the <laughs> Beatles song goes. But that was, um, you'd, you'd been restaurant critic for The Times for f 15 years, and the weight and then the loss of weight were directly connected to that job. Yeah. No, I, I worked out, I can't remember what it is now, how much weight I put on for each meal o o over that period. I think you said it was an ounce per meal. Or was a, it? A, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah. Uh, it was five pounds a year, I think, wasn't it? Or? It was, uh, something like that. Yeah. Perhaps, no, I think it's a bit more than that even now. A anyway, it was, it, was, it was a worrying amount. And so what, was it you or a doctor or a lover? Who was it who said to you, you've got to... Change. Well, I, I, I did my knee in, and I, I went to uh, see a knee specialist called George Dowd, and he said to me, as I'm sure he said to many of his patients beforehand, I can tell, Mr Meads, you're not a professional footballer, but you've got a professional footballer's injury. Um, and uh, I could operate now, but if you go and see Jeff Fine, you, he will show you how to lose weight. So I went to see this remarkable doctor called Jeffrey Fine, who um, is a psychiatrist with uh, an interest in eating disorders. And he persuaded me to lose seven stone over a year, um, and which is kind of 
something close to a miracle. Mm. But you've done it. Yeah. Um, because of the, the Fern Britain scandal recently, we have to establish that you, you didn't have a gastric band inserted or anything. I don't know what a gastric band is. Is it like a... a white... it's, an, it's an operation where they put a band around your stomach and therefore you can't eat anymore. Oh, I see. Russell Harty once had some person who'd wired their mouth shut. Mm. I always thought that's what would have happened to Prescott. Um, yeah, I, I didn't. But you, you did it entirely through diet. Yeah, through diet um, and and the will that this guy makes you find within yourself. And you say he treats eating dis disorders. Do you regard yourself as having had an eating disorder? No, I regard myself as um, as having been greedy and having been a restaurant critic and having been a restaurant critic. I mean, I, I think I think one should own up to having been greedy. I think that's what Mr. Prescott should own up to too. Um, uh, and I think anyone who does realise they're overeating does think sometimes they go and throw up. But um, well, I, we might as well get this out of the way as well. Um, the John Prescott, you, you were never secretly a bulimic. I was never secretly a bulimic. No, no. But that was out of respect for the late Princess of Wales. And you must have ended up with a, hu um, a whole wardrobe of suits that were useless to you. Yeah. So what happened to them? I, I gave them to Oxfam. And it, I, I thought, who do you give this to? And I thought, well, there's, obviously Oxfam is for the starving. So th there was something calculated in that. You live now in France. You've flown in for this interview. Was that any kind of deliberate exile, departure from Britain? Um, it's not like John Osborne saying, damn you, England, uh, if that's what you mean. No, I, I wanted to live in France, uh, or rather, I wanted to live somewhere other than London. I lived in London 40 years. I like France. I don't live the life of an expat. I don't know um, a load of people in straw hats who complain about immigrants and so on. Um, even though they are immigrants. Um, um, the France I enjoy is um, a fairly occluded sort of France, or occluded to, 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 to the British. I mean, I would, like to, I would like to, at some point, make a program about it, or make a series of programs about it. Um, uh, I, th I, th I have some regrets in that France has become more a mirror of Britain than it used to be. There used to be a great gulf, and there, there isn't any longer. What have they got now that from us? What have they got? Well, they've certainly got um, uh, political correctness in a very, very big way. There is a much more sort of constant debate um, about how to um, cope with this tyranny of minorities um, and it, 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 whether they deal with it better than we do, I don't know. We talked about your mother being broad-minded and your own childhood. Um, you, you have four daughters yourself. Are you a stern father or an indulgent one? Um, indulgent. Um, they know how to... They play me like a, like a trout on the end of a fly. We talked about you being a secularist and humanist. Um, as you get older, it sometimes happens. Such people start to have doubts about their doubts as they get nearer the end. Do you think you might? I haven't got any doubts about my doubts, no. Jonathan Meads, thank you. Thank you.